It now gives me great pleasure to announce our last speaker for the session. This is my very good friend, Dr. Tanya Tao. She graduated from the University of British Columbia and then pursued a clinical fellowship in cardiovascular anesthesiology at the University of Washington in Seattle with, with Professor Brugard. Tanya is a, a cardiac anesthesiologist from Kelowna General Hospital and unfortunately we recently lost her to the structural heart imaging team at the Royal Columbia in Vancouver. We're still a bit sad about that. Her main interest is 3D echocardiography for structural heart procedures, focus and magic, medical education. Thank you so much for joining us, Tanya. We're looking forward to your lecture. Uh, thank you very much, Elmery, uh, for the invitation. It is uh, an honor to be here. Um, <clears throat> and it is, uh, I did my fellowship at University of Washington in Seattle with Dr. Burkhard Mackinson who was a um, <clears throat> instrumental mentor and still is. Uh, so it is really an, even an extra honor to be on the same panel as him. Um, uh, I will be speaking to you today on the latest in echocardiography. Um, and uh, my images are nowhere as nice as Dr. Mackinson, but it is the, uh, this is an image, a 3D echo of uh, the very first um, uh, unicuspid aortic valve that I saw. Um, on my in my fellowship. Conflicts of interest, I do not have any. And the objective um, of this talk will be um, in my uh, uh, in my research and looking over all the journals. We'll be talking about uh, two journals on myocardial strain imaging and its utility. Um, there were a lot in the last few years on uh, aortic stenosis, and so we'll be talking about um, moving towards a 3D echocardiography towards assessing um, aortic stenosis. And then uh, there will be, uh, we'll talk about one journal on the 2D and 3D assessment of RV function. Uh, this year, a few months ago, a state-of-the-art review came out on myocardial strain imaging, um, discussing its current practice in the future. And I do think that we're moving more towards strain rather than and moving away from uh, EF assessment using bi Simpson's biplane. Um, and at the same time, this group from Norway also did um, uh, accumulated uh, some reference ranges for GLS strain. Um, for the cardiac chambers. The, so the two groups together, the two journals together, spoke about how GLS using speckle tracking in evaluating um, early subclinical LV dysfunction, it is um, it assesses longitudinal function and it is uh, assessing the fibers that are most sensitive to ischemia. It is good at uh, early detection of hypertrophy, increased wall stress, and reduce arterial compliance. And it has been shown to be superior to LVEF by Simpson's biplane in predicting survival outcomes. It is also reproducible regardless of your training in echocardiography. And in those with reduced EF, GLS of the RV um, of less than 17% was independently associated with increased mortality. Um, the downside to GLS, which be the same as uh, EF, um, is that they're both dependent on loading conditions. So the state-of-the-art review has this really nice uh, infographic showing why GLS is better than ejection fraction in assessing LV function. So here you'll see that the longitudinal myocardial fibers make up the subendocardium here, and during a remodeled uh, ventricle, it is the one that where the um, most sensitive to uh, decreased perfusion and ischemia. So it changes the most. Here in B down here, when they did EF as a function of uh, GLS, the EF didn't decline as much. And when EF is a function of um, uh, circum circumferential um, contractions, the uh, EF decline a lot more. So EF is more of an assessment of your circumferential contraction rather than longitudinal. And over here, this is a really nice uh, diagram showing that if you look at the red line, that um, represents LV wall thickness of 2.5 centimeters. And in the blue line here, it is 0.5 centimeters. And so as the wall thickens, 
So um, as the wall thickens, your EF remains the same, but your GLS declines. And that's because as your LV hypertrophies, your, um, the cavity in the LV declines and gets smaller. So you're, con you're able to contract and eject um, the same amount of volume, but your, um, there is still LV dysfunction, um, even though EF is the same. GLS is probably most uh, sensitive and most studied in aortic stenosis pathology. So um, in those undergoing TAVI, baseline GLS with that is less than 16% correlates with all cause and cardiac mortality. It has worsening functional capacity. It, increase, it has an increased incidence of atrial fibrillation, more severe aortic stenosis, and most of these patients have coronary artery disease requiring revascularization. And the recovery of GLS correlates with symptomatic improvement and improved prognosis, something that um, perhaps EF um, alone does not convey. And the Norwegian group <clears throat> um, basically uh, took about uh, 1,300 patients in this part of Norway and um, accumulated some reference data for GLS. The youngest a uh, patient is 23 years old, the oldest is 94, with the mean age of 57. And they were able to um, give a reference range of, for the LV, is around six, minus 16%. For the RV, is around 17%, which is a nice number because it correlates with TAPSI, so you can remember that. And then, of course, for the left atrial strain as well. Left atrial strain is used to assess the degree and severity of aortic stenosis as well as um, atrial fibrillation. And then RA strain, which is a measure of RV dysfunction. So all the numbers are around the same with minus 16, minus 17, minus 17, and 17. Um, <clears throat> so um, in summary, in terms of global uh, longitudinal strain, I do think we're moving, we should be moving towards assessing that rather than um, uh, EF alone. And most of uh, the software um, in your machine should be able to do global longitudinal strains. Um, uh, and I know that EF is usually a better tool to communicate with your surgeon, um, but I think the more we use it, the more, um, the more um, I think they will ask and, and we can even educate our surgeon, surgical colleague on the significance and the sensitivity of uh, GLS. Uh, moving on here, uh, we'll be talking about uh, three studies that talk about the um, that advocates for 3D analysis of whenever we are assessing um, aortic stenosis. So the European uh, group here from the UK actually um, released a clinical consensus statement uh, last year on the multimodality imaging aortic stenosis, uh, advocating for 3D echo, um, uh, cardiac MR, as well as CT. Um, the Italian group also uh, released this comprehensive uh, review on evaluation of aortic stenosis. And then the Toronto group um, uh, released this paper through BGA Education on the clinical applications of 3D echo. And I'll be uh, focusing more on the aortic stenosis aspect. Um, the state of the art review did this nice infographic on the proper, I guess, the more comprehensive assessments of aortic stenosis. And I think many of us use color Doppler already in 2D, 2D echo, and then um, it's important to add on 3D echo. And then if you, um, uh, Dr. Boca Markinson showed a nice uh, 3D uh, multiplanar reconstruction of regurgitant jets uh, and assessing um, uh, as well as the LVOT and the aortic valve annulus. And the aortic stenosis assessment is not complete without LV functional. Um, assessment using ejection fraction as well as global longitudinal strain. And then um, in the future, um, there's now the use of artificial intelligence and um, deep uh, learning models. Here, as you guys all know, the LVOT and the annulus, when you measure in 2D, um, you are prone to having um, uh, errors because you are measuring only in 2D. And if the LVOT measurement is off, that can also um, uh, miscalculate your annulus. So here is a multi 
um, planar uh, assessment via 3D of the aortic valve annulus. This particular annulus is quite circular, so it's not really a big issue, but um, most of the time you'll find that a calcified diseased aortic valve would be quite asymmetrical. Um, uh, here, most of the measurements are around 2.6, but we've had uh, um, uh, assessed values of 2.1 by 2.6. And to be able to convey that to your surgeon, you know, early on say, hey, my valve is very asymmetrical, it's 2.1 by 2.6. At least then they can, as they're scrubbing, they can think about planning for um, aortic root uh, enlargement or unplan for it. Um, and last week I had a patient whose CT um, of the aortic valve showed that the annulus was um, 2.1. So the surgeon was planning for uh, a root enlargement. And then when I went in to assess, I found that the valve was actually 2.3 by 2.4. And then you could see the relief on his face. And he said, are you sure um, it is? And I said, well, my 3D echo has spoken. Um, uh, I'm, I'm certain that it is, it is um, bigger than 2.1. And, um, and he was able to win a 23 millimeter valve and no need for root enlargement. Um, similarly, the use of 3D echo can be used in, uh, particularly if your center does a lot of aortic valve um, repairs. So measuring geometric height, coaptation height, uh, commissural height for bicuspid valves, um, and allowing and giving the surgeon a sense of what they have to do uh, in repairing it and the probability of uh, a repair success. So in... Um, uh, Aortic valve stenosis, assessing the LV is just as important. And over time, when you have chronic pressure overload on the LV, um, the LV hypertrophies, and over time, the oxygen um, demand will increase and the oxygen supply should be able to meet, and that's a well-compensated LV. In severe aortic stenosis, that's, uh, that myocardial oxygen supply um, does not meet that demand. And so the LV, the myocardium starts to fibrose and also um, it can also lead to apoptosis, apoptosis and cell death. So you have the cavity getting smaller, you have increase in fibrosis and apoptosis. The EF can be preserved or increased. It can also be preserved or increased in severe aortic stenosis, as we, many of us have seen, just because the cavity gets smaller, contractility is able to um, eject um, a smaller volume. Um, and then here are some of the findings for after aortic valve replacement, immediately after and late after where you get remodeling and the cavity increases back in size and the hypertrophy declines. Um, the, in assessing for the LV, we assess for ejection fraction and global longitudinal strain as well as stroke volume. My video is not playing, but that's okay. It is. Um, <clears throat> so this group here, Philippe, um, uh, who is, uh, I think, is a, a, a big expert in aortic stenosis, in particular, low for low gradient um, aortic stenosis, um, tagged on to uh, this partner two trial data. So if you guys remember, partner one was when they proved that TAVI and surgical AVR was equivalent in high-risk um, patients with severe aortic stenosis. Partner 2 trial found the same outcomes for moderate-risk uh, patients. And all these patients, uh, around you know 1,600 patients, had a lot of echo uh, data. Um, and so Philippe took this data and was able to stage them over um, four stages in severity of aortic stenosis. Stage one, there's no cardiac damage. Patient has just severe aortic stenosis. Stage two is when you have LV damage, chronic pressure overload, damaging the, uh, uh, the myocardium and causing also diastolic dysfunction. And EF will start to decline. Stage two, you see a backflow of damage into the left atrium and mitral valve where you have moderate to severe mitral regurgitation, you can also see um, the onset of atrial fibrillation. And in stage three, where you have pulmonary hypertension as well as perhaps severe TR. And then the last stage, stage four, is where you have RV 
dysfunction. And he was able to show that for each stage increment, there is a one year mortality increase by 45%. That is substantial. So one year mortality risk increase by 45% every time you move up a stage. This shows you that it's really important to assess not just the aortic valve, but the LV, also the left atrial. Uh, and if you can do in left atrial strain, if you can't assess for uh, mitral valve, assess for um, TR and RV dysfunction. And if you have RV dysfunction in aortic stenosis, it's usually a, a very, very bad uh, prognostic sign. And then this is one example of artificial intelligence in um, assessing, in amalgamating all that data that's out there. Um, this uh, journal J from JACC also just came out recently, shows that they were able to um, use a previously validated um, deep learning model for that predicts diastolic dysfunction and be able to predict um, the progression of aortic stenosis. So uh, deep learning model by definition just means that you have this deep neural network that's three layers or deeper. So you have input data, input layer, which is your echocardiographic features. And then all this data that's out there, that's three layers or more, defines a deep learning model. And then you have an output. So here's an example of how deep learning models work in aortic stenosis. So you have what this group did was that they took three different sets of cohorts of patients that have early signs of aortic stenosis. So in this group called the ARIC is the atherosclerosis risk in community cohort. There was 5,000 of them and 900 of them had only aortic valve sclerosis, but they were echoed and had these nine echocardiographic features. And they placed that into, they took these patients and put them into the validated um, deep learning model that predicts the probability of diastolic dysfunction. They follow these patients over a span of seven years and stratify them into high risk and low risk. Low risk def is defined as the progression of to have a diagnosis of aortic valve, as well as um, uh, needing some sort of aortic valve intervention. And this validate this um, deep learning model was able to correctly predict which patient will become low risk and which patient will be high risk. In further adding to this neuronal network, they were um, they used all the information that was in this cohort and add it into the validated model. So you add on another layer uh, of network. They also took um, another group that has moderate, mild to moderate aortic stenosis um, defined by echo and cardiac MR, and also did the same thing, placed them in, uh, ran the model through them, followed them for two years, stratify them. And again, the model was able to pre correctly predict which patient will go on to have intervention, which one will have um, diagnosis failed of valve stenosis. And they also did the same thing with the PET-CT cohort. And the PET-CT cohort, essentially, these 18 patients had um, uh, biomarkers tagged to show inflammatory markers. And actually, all 18 went on to have um, aortic valve, severe aortic st valve stenosis. Um, and these are the nine echocardiograph features that they use in the deep learning model. Most of them are uh, LV function, diastolic function, and RV function um, uh, assessment. And it is uh, quite fascinating that um, artificial intelligence can predict just if you have aortic valve sclerosis, how in seven years time, you can you have a high probability of getting, of having aortic valve stenosis. So um, I think if we can intervene, working towards intervening before LV dysfunction, before moving along the stages, um, patients would do better. So in summary, in terms of where aortic stenosis assessment is moving towards, uh, well, I think we should do a better job and, and, and try to lean towards um, using 3D uh, in assessing the aortic valve itself as well as LV function using um, GLS. And then knowing that in the future, there is uh, deep learning models and artificial intelligence coming down. Um, in the last part, um, we'll talk about the right ventricle and where um, assessment um, of right ventricle is moving towards. The right ventricle um, 
uh, is a very tricky ventricle. It is not a straightforward uh, shape. It is, uh, you can tell here that there's, um, there's an inlet and an outlet, and then the free wall, which then wraps around the LV. So it makes it a little bit harder to, um, to assess it by echo. Um, so we have a few ways in which we assess the right ventricle. I think a lot of us use TAPSI. It is simple, it is reproducible. Um, here, the, the pictures on the uh, right here is through transthoracic uh, echo and assessment of TAPSI. Um, and then we, um, some of us also do tissue Doppler also on the lateral wall of the RV. Um, unfortunately, both TAPSI and TDI uh, only measures the longitudinal contraction of the RV wall. Um, a better assessment is through fractional area change. Um, and it is down here where you um, can take um, the uh, RV area in diastole and minus that over uh, the area in systole. And it gives you a fractional area change that is a more accurate measure of RV function than TAPSI. Um, and then there's 3D assessment of the RV as well. If you can, I think most um, software out there is available for um, a quick uh, RD, uh, uh, sorry, 3D RV EF uh, assessment. And the cutoff is usually 45%, and you can even classify it among mild, moderate, or severe, 30% being severe RV dysfunction. And RVEF is probably the best um, measurement out there right now in terms of independently associated with cardiac and all-cause mortality for maize um, in patients with any cardiac diseases. So RV dysfunction in combination with any other cardiac diseases is usually um, increased in all-cause mortality. Um, if your program can do a 3D EF. Um, it will also have uh, 3D RV and systolic volume indexed to the patient um, body surface area because it uses the volume in order to um, uh, calculate EF. Um, and the volume uh, is used to classify patients who have pulmonary hypertension who are, have either decompensated or compensated RV failure. And um, the uh, reference value for end systolic volume of greater than 114 milliliters per meter squared is considered dysfunction and decompensated RV failure. Um, as the RV fails, it dilates, and when it dilates to a certain um, volume, it can become decompensated. Um, here is an example of 3D RV EF where you take um, short axis view at the medial side, short axis at the basal side, and then four chamber view of the RV. And the program then gives you an RVEF. This is uh, less than 45%, so it is mild RV dysfunction here. And the index is 66, which is um, small and compensated. RV strain is also another, um, uh, another nice, uh, way of assessing the RV. Very similar to longer, longitudinal global strain on the LV. Um, when you take uh, different views of the RV, you can run the software through and it gives you a nice uh, picture of uh, what's happening in the early stages of RV dysfunction. Over here, it also gives you RVEF and you can see pre-incision was normal immediately post um, as the chest uh, opens up and you open up the pericardium, yet the RV has more space. So the, um, the strain uh, improves as well as RVEF improves slightly. And then after whatever procedure they have, um, sonar closure RVEF comes back to normal. And um, RV strain and RVEF is a better measurement of RV function, more so than TAPSI more so than um, tissue doubler, um, but it does take time. And I know that you know when we are doing echoes for these procedures, we're moving along very, very, very quickly, as quick as we can, so we can report our findings. But in uh, RV dysfunction, if you have patients with RV dysfunction, um, usually taking the time and assess uh, the RV in, in multiple different ways. 
um, just because TAPC and tissue Doppler is so restricted. So multiple ways of assessing the RV. And this leads to the end of my talk. I only said 20 minutes, so I think I'm 20 minutes. <laughs> Tanya, thank you very much for a fantastic talk. I am I really enjoyed that. We're going to open it up now to the panel. We have some interesting questions that already came through. I think the first one is for Burkard. The question is, in your department, how do you um, go about training for these advanced modalities in your practicing cardiac anesthesiologists? What do you think is realistic a re realistic expectation for everyone? And then also, do you think this should be implemented in the NBE exam? Because currently there's very little 3D actually in the advanced perioperative exam. Yeah, these are excellent questions. Uh, thank you. I would uh, say the following. First of all, there is a paper from uh, not this year, but last year that we came out with in conjunction with the ASE. So you can find it also for free as standard recommendation and how as cardiac anesthesiologist as opposed to um, a, a cardiologist you can actually pursue this type of training and um, i've really been part of that effort to illustrate that we're well positioned to come on and join a structural heart team such as uh, uh, tanya um, timberley tau is now going to do in in vancouver which i think is great um, within the fellowship the way that we've done it, we've um, offered uh, opportunity for elective time in the structural uh, suite. Uh, the fellows can come at any point in time that they're not uh, needed uh, elsewhere, in addition to really dedicating a month or, or weeks of time to come. Uh, there's also scheduled times um, with us, but it may or may not be uh, sufficient. I think when I think back to um, for instance, what uh, Tanya did, she came whenever there was a moment of time uh, to come across and, and take a look what we were doing in, in the interventional space. Training our own faculty is time consuming and, and tedious and not always successful, uh, to be quite frank, too, because it, this is not for everyone. I have to remind the audience that this type of imaging is just very different. You have to be always on. Um, Last week, for instance, I, I did two days and they were long days. And you see uh, several cardiac anesthesiologists come through as the anesthesiologist of record and, and you're still there and, and you have to be in the procedure. You have to constantly avoid complications and, and guide the procedure in its best way. Uh, and the communication flow is much more continuous than it is in the operating room where it's maybe a sporadic assessment. So you do assessment pre-op, you have a albeit brief conversation maybe with the surgeon and then maybe some other interaction, but it's more pointed and 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 constrained for, for certain periods of time. Uh, it, you have to be ready to, um, to really uh, go into detail and communicate at all times. And, and then ultimately you also often ask to make a call and make it help with the decision, maybe even more than when in the perioperative space we present um, the evidence and what we see, but ultimately maybe the surgeon uh, will make the decision more on their own. Again, depends on the personalities. Well, thank you very much for that uh, for that answer. I think that's something that we struggle with in in uh, in all of our departments is that. Uh, the software keeps changing and then there's new stuff available and the training is not always there. We, as a fellow, you've got a lot of time to train, but once somebody has been in practice for a long period of time, it becomes more tricky to actually do that. I, I think also the next question is for, for Fabio in relation to this. With these new imaging modalities that we see, is there a lot of artifacts that we have to take into consideration that you wouldn't see or wouldn't have had previously? Yeah, I think like in terms of like a 3G artifacts, the, um, like the way they occur are pretty much similar to the way the 2G artifacts occur. Um, normally we see 
like um, some artifacts caused by the devices that they are implanting. So we need to make sure, like, uh, first of all, we need to rule out like any complications, uh, anything that you don't know exactly what is happening. But we see, especially like um, in the OR, like uh, I'm not involved like um, that much in the structural hard programming in our hostel, but in OR, in the OR, you see a lot of like artifacts on 3G also. It's important to rule out anything that you don't know exactly what you are looking at. And, and make sure you 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 present the proper information to our surgeons and I'm pretty sure to cardiology as well. Thank you very much, Fabio. Tonya, I've got some questions here for you as well. One from the audience. The first one is, is in what way will strain measurement in the OR change the operative or surgical anesthesia management? Um, that's a great uh, question because uh, obviously you can uh, tell that strain um, is a very good uh, tool to use in predicting uh, long-term outcomes. Uh, but I'll give you an example of what happened in the OR last week. Uh, normal uh, patient coming in for cabbage, normal EF, no regional wall motion abnormality, like many of our patients uh, come in for cabbage and they ended up doing six bypasses, but the strain was minus eight. That is substantial. Um, so I've communicated that to the surgeon. And of course, the surgeon's like, you know, what is strain? Is that is that better than EF? And so I was able to say, you know, it actually is a better better indicator for um, for mortality and survival uh, benefits. And, and then as we were coming off, um, there was torrential, torrential MR. Um, so as I, I was able to tell him that, hey, the LV, even though it is normal EF and no regional warm motion abnormality, there's actually a lot of dysfunction and damage uh, caused by the uh, by the ischemia. That's not conveyed in, in, in normal values, but your strain tells you that uh, the torrential MR is probably from this underlying dysfunction. Give it time, and if your graphs are adequate, the MR should subside. Um, and it tells you, you know, that, um, that I think it gives you a better, of, better picture of how sick the patient is despite having normal values that um, that it, I think I, I asked him, hey, when we come off, can we come off slowly? Don't come off so fast like any other uh, normal EF and no, no regional warm motion abnormalities. So yeah, so I think I think it does, it gives you more sensitive um, uh, uh, evaluation of your LV. Yeah, I, I fully agree. I think also the, the other question I have for you is, do you think our cardiology colleagues should start doing strain on the LA and LV instead of the butamine stress testing for patients that have low flow, low gradient? Now, we've had a recent arrest because of that in the, in the exercise lab. Oh, I think the data is, um, there's a lot of uh, research and validated data for low flow, low gradient with the butamine. I think LA strain, I, I think it's still coming up and I'm not sure that is, um, it is well validated yet. It is well, it is, it is for right now, it is I think another data point for us to point towards um, LV dysfunction. Um, I think it will be, you know, as you guys know, with low flow, low gradient AS, um, you have to have lots and lots of data. And I think the debutamine stress test has been so well validated, but if you can't, um, I think what they, I think they would move towards um, getting a calcium score before the butamine stress test. Perhaps that might be a way um, to, um, yeah. And maybe, maybe, yeah, you have a good point. Maybe moving towards um, assessing LA strain. And I, I believe it is, uh, I, I've done it a few times and it's actually quite quick on the newer software. It's not as time consuming as you think, um, not like, um, uh, you know, as Burkhard mentioned, even just last year, it took us forever. You have to go through Q Labs to assess all the strain. But now, with just one or two buttons, your strain comes up very, very quickly. Uh, so time efficiency becomes an important factor in the OR. But yeah, I added a brief uh, comment in the chat to that question, really uh, confirming that there's not that much out there yet to prove that it helps right in the acute setting. Um, but it has certainly been shown, even perioperatively, to have prognostic value. And so I think that's important to, to recognize. That's a, that's a good starting point. That said, most of the strain 
data out there and studies are certainly based on trunk thoracic and there's still more work to be done with regards to transesophageal echo obtained images that then are used for strain quantification. Thank you very much. Um, then I have another question for you, Gord. So in patients that have got P2 prolapse, sometimes what you see is that you've got a bit of prolapse of the anterior mitral valve leaflet as well, sort of like a pseudo prolapse. How do you distinguish or how can you use these modalities to distinguish between the two? When you tell the surgeon, especially with the minimally invasive when they go before they go and pump, whether he needs to do anything to the anterior mitral valve leaflet. Yeah, that's a that's an excellent question. I I think the key is again to be as cognizant as possible and as intentional as possible uh, to get the best possible image, and then look in multiple planes and cropping planes. And uh, what I do, for instance, if I have a potential for a bileaflet prolapse, I may take the three D on fast view and then maybe crop in with a flexible cropping plane from one side or the other. And um, and then and then rotate the image around and kind of look from a different perspective. Often, looking from the annular plane perspective, and so you see what's coming up and what's not. Um, the the biplane imaging also helps with that. But again, you have to be aware of how you coming down with a tilt plane, and sometimes you're foreshortening things and you're cutting obliquely, and thereby reducing a, a perpendicular image that may not fully display the pathology. Um, so I think uh, really being aware of the complex three-dimensional space and um, and then also at times shifting from um, temporal resolution to more spatial resolution may help. Uh, so there are ways to affect your image acquisition, especially if you use 3D, where maybe the emphasis doesn't need to be on a good a high frame rate, but maybe the, the emphasis really needs to be on a spatial resolution. And you, you have to stop in, in systole anyways to fully understand. Uh, lastly, you can you can still use quantitative assessment tools. And again, as uh, Tanya just said, some of these tools are now pretty quick and they, they do a, a very quick um, assessment of the surface of the leaflets. If the leaflets are well enough shown in the 3D data set. And then with that, you get a pretty good information of what is above the annular plane and what's not. Excellent, thank you very much. Just wanna check in the queue, uh, Martin, go ahead. Uh, Burkhardt, referring to what you said and you are heavily involved in, it was NBE, and looking at our guidelines, this is where we started, how we can standardize uh, these additional modalities, 3D modalities, so to make sure that we are speaking the same language. Is it where the main difficult comes? Uh, if you can comment on that. Yeah, another excellent uh, question. Thank you. Um, so I think it's twofold. One is, what works for you in your particular setting and be that in the operating room with our cardiac surgeons or be that in an interventional suite and you know what are the expectations from your partners again surgeon or interventionalist you have to be somehow on the same page you have to uh, find ways to uh, determine convention i'll give you one example you may have noticed in some of my multiplanar views that on the left lower, maybe the short axis of the mitral valve was still upside down as opposed to the 3D in the right lower corner. Um, those may be examples that maybe I got uh, several months ago. Maybe now I've been more aware of using because it's quicker and I also have more memory options, meaning I can go to a um, um, set home stage, meaning I can, I can arrange my images in the multiplanar fashion and I can give the machine an indication that whenever I go back into a 3D image for the mitral valve, I want it to be dis displayed in this multiplanar fashion. And so I take an extra step and, and rotate Z, if you will, with the Z ax axis and rotate everything so it's on fuss. But again, if I do that on a sudden, my interventional cardiologist may say like, well, that looks different. 
you know, what have you done? And so you have to be very um, clear in your communication. When it comes to training and setting standards, I, I do believe that there's no way around in having um, the Canadian Society of Echocardiography or the ASE uh, and both uh, international, the Europeans agree on, on real standards and guidelines and how this should be displayed. And that's what we try to do with the screening paper where we had really an international group come together uh, to inform these ASE stand standards. And then lastly, back to the training, uh, again, the, the, the training um, paper that we put together for, for what you, you know, what's the expectation of how many, let's say mitral clip or mitral tia procedures do you have to have done so that you're good to go and that, that you are actually in a good position to guide these procedures. Uh, we've agreed on minimum numbers again they're a little bit arbitrary but came about based on our combined experience it's a it's a new evolving uh, specialty of interventional echocardiography and we are kind of um, you know trying our best to come up with setting expectations appropriately uh, we certainly want to increase the number of folks that can participate and i can assure and encourage the audience from a perioperative point of view I do think we are extremely well positioned, uh, short of hospital and uh, reimbursement questions. They're all separate and they all have their 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 um, their focus and need to need to improve. I do believe, from an imaging point of view, how well we image with transesophageal echo, uh, regardless if that's a small probe that are coming through or a bigger um, standard uh, adult probe, we are extremely quick and transitioning from our perioperative phase to actually bringing about information. Um, I know this from many industry partners, uh, Abbott or, or others who are impl you know, implanting MitraClip, for instance, when they open up a new program and they see there is a cardiac anesthesiologist involved, they're quite relieved and happy because it's gonna go, uh, gonna pick up you know, speed uh, much, much more quickly. Thank you, that's excellent. Uh, thank you very much for a fantastic session. Thank you again to Martin and Marcus for having us and really congratulations on a wonderful preoperative symposium. I'm gonna hand it over to Marcus now. I think we'll, we'll wrap it up a little bit over the time. Thank you. So okay, go ahead, Martin. So indeed, it um, brings us to the end of our today symposium. Uh, as always, there is many thanks um, to express. First of all, to all our attendees, most of you managed to stay till very end. Thank you so much. Uh, once again, big thanks to organizing and planning committee for all your help, advice, and time commitment. Um, I think this wouldn't be possible if we are not um, constantly challenged, as Burkhard mentioned, by cardiologists, by our surgical colleagues, that's uh, probably one of the strongest stimulations um, to keep and, and be up to date. Uh, the big thanks to our patients, that's where it all starts. They are subjected to our, our echo examinations and, uh, and to our learning. Just want to say thank you to all uh, the new collaborators that we have now. You know, each year we try to reach out to more and more centers in order to establish um, both collaboration networks for research, for teaching, for presentations, and you know, to have uh, a number of new centers that we've never worked with before uh, step up to the plate and add to the symposium was really uh, was really uh, something special. I think you know, we never had speakers from Japan before. And uh, and and uh, Halifax is a new center for us as well, so that's great. Uh, I just want to make sure that we take the time to thank uh, Mark and uh, Fatima from Ardeen, as well as another thanks for Sarah Russell for all her hard work in putting everything together. And uh, again, all the participation and attendance from the audience has been fantastic. The last couple of days has really enriched our symposium. We want to just encourage you to fill out the evaluations. Uh, not only is it useful for us in order to tell us what went well and what didn't go well, what you enjoyed and what could have been better, but uh, also there's a 
one of the most valuable things for us is to fill in the part where it asks about topics that you'd want to hear more about in the future. That that would that's really valuable for us in order to develop the programming for the next year. Uh, we're looking at around the same time, September 2025. So uh, we'll keep you up to date with regards to uh, those things. But uh, if you submit the the uh, evaluations, then uh, we will be sure to send out your certificate of attendance and your CME credits uh, early uh, this week and next. And uh, I would like to remind everyone, um, especially in context of recertification for perioperative TE exam, uh, it's changed recently. There is no re-examination anymore, but you need to have certain number of points. And this particular symposium gives you 12 hours, which, which probably will be helpful. Okay, so thanks everyone. And we'll, I think we'll wrap it up there. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. And uh, really appreciate all your involvement. Thank you very much.